let me introduce myself so you at least kind of know what I'm talking about. My name's Garrett. I worked at Intel on their graphics profiling team. That was fun. I also worked at PlayStation. Um, I'm from Bend, Oregon, so Bend Studio happens to be in Bend. They made Days Gone. I did not work on Days Gone. Um, the project I was working on got canceled, actually, so I can never talk about it legally ever again. <laughs> Uh, I'm Ace Rolla. I make videos on my graphics projects and the theory behind them. I've been doing this full time for about two years now. Uh, here's some like screenshots of my projects. I do post processing effects mainly. So this is on Final Fantasy 14. I probably should have put a before and after. This is my ASCII shader, which looks pretty cool. Um, I made a water scene thing. This is like a some of signs. There's videos on all these if you care. And then uh, this is like a volumetric cloud thing for when I recreated the Counter-Strike 2 smoke grenades. And lastly, I suffer from really bad TMJ disorder. So my jaw stops opening after I've been too expressive for a while. It's how God punishes me for having a good time. <laughs> so I'll be a bit lower energy instead of how I usually am for videos. Sorry. Anyways, back to the topic. What is a compositor effect? A compositor effect is a GPU workload dispatched at a specific stage of the Godot render pipeline. All right, that's it. <laughs> you guys can leave for now. Um, for most of you, that probably doesn't really mean anything. And for other people, that's like, oh my god, wow, everything is possible now. Because <laughs> with compositor effects, pretty much everything is now possible in Godot. <laughs> Whether you subscribe to this theory of the universe is irrelevant. So let's talk about some applications. First, compositor effects and post-processing. Uh, this is probably the most obvious application for compositor effects because post-processing in Godot has been a bit of like a pain point in its history, specifically with myself. Um, my expertise is in post-processing and in Godot they're currently quite limited and because of that I pretty much never considered moving to the engine. Uh, Godot post-processing shaders can't render to multiple buffers they can't access the depth or normal buffers, which is like a, an extremely bad limitation. And uh, most multi-pass effects just aren't possible. This means that as Godot's post-processing shaders currently exist, we're mostly limited to single pass effects like color correction and multi-pass effects that repeatedly operate on the color buffer instead of anything else like blur. And I'm, I'm sure you could probably do bloom. I didn't really verify that. Um, until today, of course, because we have compositor effects now. It turns out compositor effects can do all of these things. This is because, as I previously said, compositor effects can execute any GPU workload we want at any point of the Godot rendering pipeline. So if we look at these five flags, if we just tacked a post-processing compositor effect onto the end, then we have a post-processing effect. Pretty simple. With these restrictions lifted, all the advanced post-processing effects are now on the table, like screen space ambient occlusion, bloom, which everybody loves, depth of field. I actually put before and afters for this one. I decided to do that halfway through the slides, I guess. The Kuahara filter, that's a popular one. The difference of Gaussians is for stylization and stuff and various edge detections are possible as well with compositor effects. Now, obviously, Godot offers a lot of these just built in to the engine for you to use. But now with compositor effects, we can implement all of these effects ourselves without modifying the engine source code. And this is where I think the value is most obvious because it, it takes post-processing from like the Stone Age to the Space Age. All right, I haven't talked about myself for more than a couple minutes, so how am I currently trying to use compositor effects? 
Currently, I'm trying to replicate Reshade in Godot. If you're unfamiliar with Reshade, it's a generic post-processing injector for games. And it's how I apply my shaders to games like Final Fantasy XIV or Elden Ring. It provides a UI which shows a bunch of compiled shaders, and you can enable and disable these shaders and rearrange them to create whatever post-processing pipeline you could desire. It sounds complicated, but with the Godot compositor, this is actually really trivial to replicate because under the hood, the compositor is just a collection of compositor effects or an array if you have a computer science degree. <laughs> These effects are executed sequentially, I think. So SSAO would go first and then Bloom. And since it's an array, we can add and remove compositor effects at runtime if we wanted to. And we could also rearrange them to change the order that they execute. So in a sense, the reshade UI is pretty much the same thing as the compositor effect array. The ideal end result here would be reshade functionality in any Godot project, allowing developers to easily create advanced post-processing pipelines for their games or use it for like a photo mode or something. Anyways, enough about post-processing. There are other stages of the Godot render pipeline. We've got one before opaque geometry, one before the sky, one before transparent geometry, and one at the end where we would do our post-processing. Why does this matter? Uh, well, it enables us to capture specific information we want from different stages of the pipeline. For example, maybe you want like a mask of all the opaque geometry before the transparency is drawn on top of it. Or maybe you want to apply a post-processing effect to only opaque geometry. Or maybe you want to render something on the sky, like injecting cloud rendering or like Aurora Borealis rendering. That's pretty cool. But remember that compositor effects are generic GPU workloads and can do more than just dispatch shaders. One example is draw calls. Compositor effects can draw geometry directly into the scene whenever you want which is pretty cool. Procedural meshing is one application here. Algorithms like marching cubes are now possible with compositor effects. I mean, obviously it was possible before, but now you can do it on the GPU and it's a lot faster. It would handle both the creation of the mesh and drawing it into the scene, which is so cool. But who actually cares about the Godot rendering pipeline? Let's not forget that compositor effects are generic GPU workloads. <laughs> This means we could just make our own rendering pipeline if we wanted to. <laughs> it's pretty rare that you need a custom rendering pipeline, but one example in recent history is splatting, which is an efficient means of rendering millions of points for highly detailed 3D scenes. The issue with splatting is that you're pretty much hard committing to rendering points instead of triangles, which is how the usual rendering pipeline works. Splatting also isn't really relevant in game dev because of how static the scenes are but that's besides the point. One game that has made it work is Dreams. Surely you have heard of it. Dreams uses a custom point rendering pipeline, which would have been impossible in Godot before. But now, thanks to compositor effects, which are generic GPU workloads, and that includes dispatching compute shaders, we could just uh, tack a custom rendering pipeline onto the end of Godot's underlying render pipeline and completely ignore its existence. And then we'd have splatting in Godot. At this point, I think I have shined some light on the potential of compositor effects. I'm sure you all now have many ideas of your own to go home and work on. Sorry, I'm not really showing off anything of my own and I'm being the ideas guy. But in my defense, I only started working with these a few months ago. Now let's talk a bit about the bad or pain points of compositor exists as they currently exist. As we all know, with great power comes great responsibility. Compositor effects are a pretty thin wrapper over the graphics API that holds Godot's graphics engine together. This means they don't really do anything for you other than just execute the underlying API functions. This means the burden is on you to do pretty much everything. And that means manual compilation of shaders, manual construction of command lists, and manual GPU resource management. If you're familiar with graphics API code, then this isn't really a huge deal. But for someone new to it, it might be a little daunting, especially because I would say the docs are kind of lacking at the moment. You're probably better off just reading Vulkan documentation. 
Additionally, I would say compositor effects are at odds with the existing direction of Godot shaders. GD shaders aren't compatible with compositor effects. So there's kind of this weird dichotomy in Godot graphics right now between the GD shaders and the raw shader code that you would be compiling for compositor effects. It's almost like there's like two different shader languages. Thankfully, these problems can be solved with a bit of tooling work. In my own time, I have written some scripts that automatically compile and recompile compute shaders in the project. I've also tried to replicate the functionality of other engines that I will not name. Uh, to make dispatching shaders and managing memory easier. Um, I made my own little shader language too, which is kind of like um, just informs the compiler of the kernels because the problem is if you want to have multiple compute shader kernels, uh, you would have to have them all in separate files, which is really bad if you have an effect that has like 20 kernels because then you'd have like 20 different files. So I wrote this wrapper language that allows you to have it all in one file instead. Uh, this sounds like a lot, but it really took like two days to make all this. So yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's not that bad. I promise you can do it. Other than that, uh, there aren't really any major limitations of compositor effects I'm aware of because again, they are generic GPU workloads. The freedom they give you is both a blessing and a curse but their existence is the beginning of a great future for graphics programming in Godot, and the potential is limitless. Anyways, that is all from me. Any questions? I have one. You. Yeah. So um, if it's manual, does that mean that you can just write some HLSL shaders in there and you have to compile it yourself and it'll run? Like, how does that? Yeah, well, um, I would recommend doing GLSL, but you could probably do HLSL, yeah. But your language will work if you just compile it yourself, like SpurV or something like that? Yeah, it compiles to SpurV. Got it. Let's repeat the question for the mic. Oh, sorry. The question was, um, do you just write some HLSL and then manually compile that yourself to SpurV? The answer is yes. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I'm assuming uh, compositor effects are a node. Like, uh, say you have to run a compute shader on some kind of process, like you have to uh, calculate collision a bunch of times, but you only have to do it when something specific's in there. Does that mean you can just add and remove compositor effects at will in order to make it so that I only need it for this one thing. I don't need you for whatever anymore. That is such a great question. Um, I think that is left as an exercise for the developer to figure out themselves. Um, compositor effects are a resource. They're not technically a node. The compositor is attached to the environment node, which honestly has been a bit of a headache getting certain functionality into compositor effects because they don't extend into the node, they extend resource, but I guess that's besides the point. My answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've got plenty of time. You mentioned that um, that compositors are not accessible through GD script uh, or sorry GD shaders. Um, wouldn't it be possible to accept, uh, access them as rasterized buffers instead through sampler two Ds? That's a great question. I do not know. Okay, <laughs> that would make sense though. Oh, I think Chad is just choosing someone. I trust him. Uh, so now that we have compositor effects, what's like your next like dream feature for Godot's rendering pipeline? Uh, well, I kind of like doing my own thing, so I probably won't pay attention to any new features in Godot for the next <laughs> five or so years, but ideally, as I explained at the end of my presentation, th there's definitely a lot of tooling that needs to be done to make like resource management easier. Like obviously I have my own stuff that I've rolled, but 
uh, whether it actually works or not is another question. So it would be cool if there was a more official, I would say, abstraction of compositor effects to make them easier to use for the average user. Chad, no. They're just passing it down. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so I'm currently using compositor effects using C Sharp. Um, I'm doing like ray marching for clouds and the buffers that I'm using for accumulation. So I have to use an A and B buffer to swap back and forth so they don't step on each other. When I'm doing that, every time I change anything, the memory, because of how Godot works with resources, seemingly doesn't like the sp uh, spur file doesn't get like deleted when I rebuild the C sharp, like it would normally with a node. So as a result, I have to close Godot every time I want to reload. Um, have you found a solution for this? Are you are you working around that? Are you using C Sharp or GD Script? I'm using GD Script. So I would not know anything about C Sharp, unfortunately. But I do run into that situation a lot where I kind of just close Godot and open it back up and things work again. <laughs> Can I just shout my question? Yeah, Chad, and please. This is just for recording, really. Just so it gets on recording. Uh, first off, thanks for coming to GodotCon. Uh, secondly, so the question. Closer, closer the mic, closer. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> so the question specifically is about your reference to potentially replicating uh, reshade functionality in Godot. Uh, you talked about that being something you were working on. When every that comes to fruition, is that something you expect to release as maybe a plugin for Godot, or are you hoping that that can be implemented somehow in Godot itself? I will certainly release it on GitHub. Uh, but I mean, the cool thing about the compositor, right, is that anybody that writes a compositor effect, you can kind of just download it and shove it into your Godot project. So. I don't think it would need to be like officially implemented into the engine. That's a lot of responsibility. So I guess my answer is I will probably not look to have it be like an official Godot thing, but I will release it, that's for sure. Expect a video on it within the next three years. <laughs> yeah. Um, how difficult is it to pass custom data from one compositor to a different compositor, like later, like at a different step? Um, well, because you control all of the GPU resources yourself, as long as you have that reference to like the resource ID, you can just pass that. I'm trying so hard not to curse. Sorry. Um, you can just pass that between the compositor effects and it should just work. Anybody else? You, sir. No one else is going to ask. Um, have you looked into the Vulcan ray trace plumbing that's currently got a pull request open? Ray trace plumbing? Yeah, the, like the, AP, the connections in the C++ to allow for ray tracing on, through Vulcan. That would be so cool. No, I have not looked into that. I do have a ray tracing GPU now. I should probably learn about that. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for coming, everybody. I hope you enjoyed my talk.